Hi, I'm John Nunn and in this video I'm going to talk about a recent book published by Gambit Publications, 600 Modern Chess Puzzles by Grandmaster Martin Kravtsev. Well, another puzzle book you might say, but they all take a slightly different slant on the puzzle theme. In the olden days, puzzle books tended to steal material from one another and when you saw a new puzzle book, it was quite likely you had seen many of the positions before. But these days, with large databases available, a conscientious author has the perfect opportunity to get a selection of positions from recent games which readers are very unlikely to have seen previously. And that's certainly the case with this book. The vast majority of the games are from 2019, and they're taken from games of all standards and it's certainly true that games between players of quite modest ratings can contain interesting and often very entertaining play. The positions vary quite a lot in difficulty in this book. Some are pretty straightforward and it goes all the way up to really challenging positions. So I'd just like to show you three positions from the book which give you a flavour of what you might expect. First of all, let's take a look at this position. It's white to play, and rather unusually, the author gives us a choice. He says, should you play queen c7 or queen e7? Well, let's take a quick look at the position. White obviously has the advantage. He has three pawns for the exchange, and in addition, black's king is very exposed, although there's no immediate attacking idea. But if white can consolidate his material advantage and not allow any dramatic counterplay by black, then there's no question that he stands to win. But how can he do that? Which one of these two moves is the correct continuation? Well, here you might like to pause the video and think about the answer yourself. Right, well, let's click on this and see what we get. This is from a game played in Hastings, Larson Wilson, and in the game White actually made a mistake. He played his queen to e7 and this allowed black to force perpetual check with this rather surprising rook sacrifice and then a further check it's perhaps not immediately obvious that this is perpetual check. Sure, if the king goes to f1, black has a check on d1, forcing the king back again. But what about the king moves to the h-file? Well, it turns out that they aren't any better either. If the king goes to h1, black checks on h3, and again, king goes to g1, queen goes back to g4. Or the main move, king h2, then queen f4 check. And surprisingly, there's no way to escape from these checks. If the king goes to g1, black just checks on g4 again, and other squares are no better. King g2 is also met by queen g4 check, and king h1 may look like the way out, but in this case, black just checks on f3. And next move, he has a check on either on f4 again, or on g4. There's no way to escape from the checks. So if we go back to the diagram position, we can see that the correct move is actually playing the queen to c7. Now the rook sacrifice on g2 doesn't work because the white queen can interpose on g3. So if black doesn't do something special now, white is just going to play g3, defending the pawn and maintaining his very substantial material advantage. So the critical line is if black plays king takes pawn. But the king is really exposed here. White pushes ahead with f3, which starts to take away squares from the black king. Notice that it's almost always a good idea to, when you're kind of conducting an attack such as this, to put your pawns on the opposite coloured squares to your bishop. 
so you don't duplicate control. The pawn shouldn't control the squares that the bishop's already controlling. They should control different squares. And then you're much more likely to um, be able to corner the enemy king. But as it happens, there's already quite a serious threat from this move, and that's to play um, queen to h2 check, king goes to g5 and then queen g3 check with a skewer. There's not very much black can do. If the rook runs away, white just plays his queen to g7. Notice that the follow-up, we check and check, is no good because white plays g3 check, winning the queen and mating in a few moves. And other moves aren't much better. The black king is simply too exposed. For example, check on b1, king h2, and the black king's looking in a more and more vulnerable position. And the finish might be queen back to the defence, check, check. And black must either give up his queen or he gets mated next move with the bishop coming to f2. So that's a, this is an example of the typical decision that you face in over the board play. You have what is fundamentally a winning position but you have to kill the enemy counterplay in order to actually score the full point. And a lot of the puzzles in this book, although some of them are straightforward, well, I say straightforward, perhaps not so simple, but simple in concept, tactical ideas, but quite a lot of the positions are of the tricky sort that you tend to get in over-the-board play. You know, do you play A or B where they may appear to be superficially very similar? Okay, let's go on to have a look at the second position I've chosen, which I found quite entertaining. Well, here it's black to play, and white has just taken a pawn on h5 with his rook. Now, you'll notice that black is the exchange up in this position, but white has the immediate threat of mate in one, rook takes h8, and black can't play rook takes h5 because of queen g8 mate. And there's also something else black has to watch out for, queen to a8 check, which might also be very awkward for black. Well, the question that's being posed here is what should black do? And what's interesting about this is that you're not told whether you're playing for a win or a draw, just like in over-the-board play where you don't really know what you can hope for. Um, and the first look at the position shows that despite Black's material advantage, he has quite a few problems here. His rook is under attack, and he has to worry about this queen coming to a8. Indeed, if Black should at this stage play his queen to f6, then queen would go to a8 with immediate mate. So it's not completely obvious how Black can avoid defeat here. Still, there's the question, are you playing for a draw or a win? And this is where you might like to pause the video and think about the answer for yourself. OK, let's click on the link and go to the solution. It turns out that black can't hope for more than a draw from this position, and in fact there's only one move that secures the draw. Notice that simply moving the attacked rook is no good because then this check on a8 that I mentioned before occurs. Black has to interpose and the queen comes to c6 check and black now either has to put his queen in the way when white just takes it or he has to play rook here and then white gives a check. Black has only one legal move and then queen takes rook his mate. So the attempt to defend by playing the rook to f8 fails. I already mentioned that queen to f6 allows mate in one, so black does appear to be rather short of moves. But there is one way he can save the game, and that's by playing for a counter-attack. The correct move is to play the rook to e1, which of course threatens mate in one, but leaves the rook on h8, on breeze with check. Well, white actually has nothing better than to take it, so let's see what happens. Only one legal move. It turns out that there's no really good way to defend this knight. For example, if white plays 
queen d2, black replies rook d1, and the queen has no square from which it can maintain its defence of the knight, so white loses his queen. The drawing line is actually continues with queen to g5 check. Now black interposes his queen. It's no good playing king to d6 because white gets a decisive attack after rook to d8 check. So after queen g5 check, black plays queen f6. Now at this point, white can win black's queen. He could play rook e8, takes queen d8 queen, but of course there's this lurking threat of mate on c1, and that would actually lose for white. So after black interposes his queen, white actually has nothing better than to give another check with his queen. Black only has one legal move again, and white just goes back, and it's a draw by perpetual check. So in this case, black had to give away a whole rook with check, and it was the only way to save the game. I found that quite an entertaining puzzle. Um, now let's go on to the third puzzle, which is again is a typical over the board situation. It's white to play, and there's no hint given, you just have to find the best move. And it's clear that there's a lot of tempting possibilities here. One first notes the weakness of the black square on f7, it's already attacked by the knight, and would be attacked by the queen as well, if only this rook weren't in the way. And white has a number of potential continuations here. He could play rook takes d8 check to open the diagonal for the queen to f7. Black, of course, would have to recapture with his bishop so as to defend f7 with a rook along the rank. Or white can play first, perhaps, bishop takes c5. Or white could play perhaps queen takes b6. All of these are candidate moves. Perhaps not the only ones, but these are probably the most obvious ones. And you might like to pause now and think about the position to try to determine which sequence of moves wins for white. OK, let's click on the link and see the solution. Well, white actually made a mistake in the game. He took on c5. And now black was able to escape because he doesn't recapture immediately on c5, which would lead to the same continuation that, that white missed, but instead exchanges on d5 and then takes back on c5. Now material is equal and black is, in fact, out of danger. Another possibility, possibility in the diagram is to take the pawn. This leads to a sequence of exchanges, pretty much force for both sides. Now the rook hangs, and OK, black now has lost a pawn, but white has quite a few problems here. Black immediately threatens mate in one, and the white queen, which was aggressively placed in the starting position here, is now quite offside, and really black has pretty good counterplay for the pawn here. It's very unlikely that white can win with his queen so offside and with black's pieces all actively bunched together in the centre of the board displaying quite a lot of uh, piece activity. So although that wins a pawn it doesn't look like it's going to win the game. So if we go back to the diagram let's find the correct sequence of moves. It's always confusing when there are multiple captures because not only do you have to consider each capture, you will also have to consider the various sequences in which the captures can take place. And here the correct sequence is to take first on d8. Black's reply, as I say, is forced because he has to defend the f7 square with the rook. So he must take with the bishop. Now white takes on c5. Black has been deprived of the opportunity to exchange on d5 in between, like he did in the variation I showed a moment ago. Well now if black takes the knight, white plays queen takes b6 with deadly threats, threatening simply to take the rook and, well, winning a pawn while keeping a large positional advantage as well because the black queen is seriously out of play on the edge of the board. So, okay, it's still some work to do, but a pawn up with a positional advantage is 
very likely to be decisive. But what happens if black reed simply recaptures the bishop? Well, in this case, the weakness of the f square, f7 square finally plays a decisive part. White takes on f7 with his knight. Black has to recapture, otherwise he faces a horrible discovered check. Also the bishop's attacked. So takes, and now rook to d7. The knight sacrifice on f7 has drawn the black rook into a position where it's pinned. Now white attacks it again with his own rook. So there's a double attack against the rook on f7, and black has no way to deal with this. Even if he jettisons a piece here, like this, to defend the rook, white can win very simply here. Perhaps the easiest is to simply exchange all the pieces on f7 with an easily winning king of pawn ending with an extra pawn. I think this gives these three positions give you an idea of the contents of the book. The puzzle, puzzles are very practically oriented. They're not artificial positions. They involve typical over the board game decisions. And for that reason, I think that they offer a very good selection for training purposes. So that's 600 modern chess puzzles. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed watching the video and thank you.